Ferrari's front-engine V12s are amongst the most glorious cars on the planet, and I've been lucky enough to drive quite a lot of them, but not all. So, in the last video I had my first ever drive in a Ferrari 365 GTB4, better known as a Daytona. If you haven't seen that film, then just click on the link in the description down below. In this video, also with the help of Bell Sport and Classic, I'm going to have my first taste of a 550 Maranello, a car that arrived 23 years after the last 365 GTB4 rolled off the production line, but was nonetheless its direct successor. And the 550 is a car that I've wanted to drive for a long time. The Daytona, I was intrigued to drive. This 550 Maranello, I have to say, I am very, very excited to drive because, well, that well, it came out before I was born. This came out when I was 14, when I was sort of really in the height of my, my love of Ferrari. And every test it seemed to do, it just seemed to, well, be garlanded with praise. And everything I read about it suggested that it was just incredible. I also realised what an important car this was, Ferrari, because everything up to that point in my life had really been mid-engined. Certainly in the, the supercar frame, yes, it was the 456 that came out in 1992, which was front-engined V12 rear drive, but that was a 2 plus 2. This was their halo supercar capable of 199 miles an hour. And when everyone else was doing mid-engine, mid-engine seemed to be the only way, here was Ferrari front engine, rear drive, it seemed like a throwback, but they were saying not. Because it was such an important car, the first front engine V12 supercar for 23 years, I think Ferrari wanted to raid its back catalogue a bit in terms of the design. So down at the front, we very much look back. So we've got the two front vents here, which hark back to sort of 275 GTB, even 250 GTO. We've got these fared in headlights, which are a bit 512M, which was of course the last of those mid-engine cars, but also perhaps harked back to the Daytona. And then at the back, well, that is definitely Daytona with the two round lights and that very much cut off cam tail. Also this rear deck that you can see through the rear screen with the luggage straps there. It just looks right. I don't think it can be considered a real Pininfarina beauty because of that prominent nostril in the bonnet. But overall, the shape, the proportions, they look really, really good. And in fact, not wildly different, in fact, from the Daytona. It doesn't seem that in the 23 years since that went out of production, everything has swelled massively. Yes, this has gained an extra 10 centimetres in the wheelbase, an extra 20 centimetres in the front track, an extra 13 and a half in the rear track. But overall, it still looks, certainly to my eyes today, pretty compact. Under the bonnet, of course, there's still a naturally aspirated V12, but rather different to the Colombo one in the Daytona. Whereas the 365 followed the Ferrari convention of referring to the swept volume of an individual cylinder, the 550 refers to the total 5.5 litre displacement of the engine. The reason behind this was that if it had followed the traditional naming strategy, it would have been called a 456, and there was already one of those on sale at the time. Anyway, this F133A engine is an all-alloy 65-degree 4-cam V12 with Nicosil liners, titanium alloy conrods and a dry sump. It puts out 478 brake horsepower at 7,000 rpm and 420 pounds-foot at 5,000 rpm, which is 131 bhp and 102 pounds-foot up on the Daytona. Like the older car, the 550 retains a transaxle layout, but it gains an extra ratio. This particular car has done just 10,000 miles and feels beautifully preserved as a result. The overall design is just more harmonious, I think, than the Daytona, which sort of, you rather feel stuff was put where it, it could be, whereas this feels well, much more designed. The view out over the bonnet as well is, is more what you expect, really, being able to see that central bulge and this wing over here as well. Also, the gated gear lever, now much more prominent, much more sort of shorter, stubbier lever here, but that gate in, in pride of place there. These are the standard seats. You could get sports seats as well, but I just think they, they look a little bit out of place. So these, they feel really nicely bolstered as well. Now, obviously the Daytona was known for being quick, sort of through things like the Cannonball Run, but this had its own sort of speed mythology around it because it set a world production car speed record in 1998, in October 1998, at Marysville, in the USA, where it covered 100 kilometers at 192.6 
miles an hour. In fact, in an hour it covered just over 184 miles, which um, is pretty extraordinary when you consider that it had to refuel in that time as well, despite having a massive 114 litre fuel tank, although that is actually slightly smaller than the Daytona's fuel tank, which is 128 litres. Can you believe it? Looking around in here, the dials still seem sort of fairly familiar from the Daytona. Also, you've got the switches along here, including one for sport, because this has adaptive dampers. It was a heavy car, this though, sort of at least probably 300 kilos more than Daytona. But everyone says you don't feel it when you drive it. So, let's see if they're right. You get into this and initially you think it's going to be very GT that long-legged continent crossing sort of car that the Daytona is, and to some extent it is. The speed sensitive steering, so it gets less assistance as you get faster, is, like I say, initially, you think it feels quite light, and there's so much torque from this V12 as well, so it has that rangey sort of feel to it. But then also you quickly realize that it feels like a pretty small car, actually. It feels really nimble and precise. It also feels remarkably quick. You get into it and it's got so much torque that you can pull away in third without any complaints at all. It's just so smooth and it lulls you into this sense of, well, sort of, that it's going to be just a, a continent crusher, a long-legged car. But then you drop down a gear, maybe two, and it really picks up and goes. I saw a quote saying that this had the performance of an F40 in a GT car's body, and I thought, really? I mean, I know that 0 to 62 is 4.4 seconds, that's only, what, half a second down on an F40, and it's 199 miles an hour flat out, so that's, what, two miles an hour, I think, down on an F40, but it just didn't seem like it could live up to that. Fine, the delivery is obviously very different because the F40 has that explosive delivery of its torque from the turbocharged engine, but overall, yeah, this is quite something. Tipping the scales at nearly 1,700 kilos, the Maranello weighs about half a metric tonne more than an F40 and around 300 kilos more than the Daytona. And yet, the 550 seems to shrug off its mass almost miraculously, both in a straight line and in the corners. Initially in normal mode, as I say, we've got two, two modes for the dampers. Normal mode, it feels all right, but put it into sport. And that's something you think, in a modern car, you probably wouldn't really want to do because it would make it crashy on the road and, and not particularly nice necessarily. Not in every car, obviously there are some Cars like the Cayman GT4, for example, feels really good in sport. But this, again, it just brings the car more alive. Turn in the front end, you instantly know it is, and then the throttle just beautifully picks up that rear end. This is so much more precise and, and playful, actually, than I thought it sort of would be, sort of from initial impressions. But it's like, it's almost like a BMW M2, but with a big V12 in it. All the controls are really nice. So obviously we've got this open gated manual here, which gets better as it gets warmer. But also the steering wheel just feels like a really nice size. It's just, it's perfect to hold. It's obviously the antithesis of a modern Ferrari steering wheel, which is festooned with buttons. And the pedals as well, really nicely weighted. Weighted in a way that you, you just don't find in a current supercar. It's amazing how much more intimate it feels in here than Daytona because you'd expect the newer car, I don't know, to, to feel sort of bigger I suppose, but it really doesn't. I love all these switches here as well, so easy and accessible. I mean, I kind of, why do we go to touch screens? Something else I love is this door handle because particularly if you put your thumb on the top there for controlling the window switches, it feels like something out of a helicopter or something like that. It feels really Really cool. It's just lovely, isn't it, hearing the sound of that gear shift. Talking of sound, actually, it's, um, it's 
a lovely sound, but it's not a particularly loud one. Very cultured, very sophisticated. When you think of modern V12 Ferraris, the scream is like the F12 and the A12 Superfast. It feels like a very different animal. It's beautiful through there. Just so well balanced. That beautiful front engine rear feel. And that's something that you wouldn't get, I don't think, from all but maybe the very best mid-engine cars. But even then, there's a, a slight edginess that you just don't have with this. You can pour the front end in and then work the rear in a way that is somehow distinctly front engine rear drive. I do love it. There really is something friendly about a front engined rear drive layout. Friendly and fantastic when there is a Ferrari V12 involved. It is fascinating to compare the Daytona and 550, two totems of the genre that have so much in common, yet also feel so distinct. I'd love to go on longer drives in both, as I think they are cars that would relish a road trip. But if I could only take one of them, well, I enjoyed the Daytona, but the 550 stole my heart.